the Olympics. Um, I think probably everything I learned uh, that, uh, or the vast majority of what I learned that's bad about the Olympics, I uh, I did by reading uh, your book on uh, the the Rio Games, uh, and we spoke about Sochi, um, and. Yeah. And and this came up and and I know I want to talk about like you know Echo Park and what that says about uh the LA games but first you know it came up the other I don't know a couple of weeks ago uh and someone was like you know they're going to play the Tokyo uh, Olympics but there's going to be no fans that right. are going to be there and I mean give me your perspective on that because I was like oh wait is that good because I like the games I just don't like what um what the games as an institution what they do to those cities that they're in. And yeah. I would imagine a big part of that is because they're, they're, they're basically using this as a one-off, you know, major tourist attraction that is functioning at the same way as like, almost like uh, disaster capitalism does. Yeah. It's just, you know, a shock to the system. We come in and this is the way we're going to sort of reorient things. What, give me your take on the Tokyo and then we'll talk about LA. That's a sporting shock doctrine. Uh, over 70% of the people of Tokyo don't want the Olympics there. They think it's going to be a super spreader event, uh, that the vaccination rate is incredibly low in Tokyo and in Japan as a whole. Uh, they've done an amazing job controlling the pandemic because of people willing to wear masks. Um, but but as far as like vaccinations, terrible. And I, they don't want the games because where the games go, you get debt displacement and the militarization of public space. And I was in Tokyo right before everything shut down because of COVID and you saw it there. You saw those fears. Um, I spoke to people who had been pushed out of their homes. I spoke to uh, this one family that was thrown out of their homes for these Olympics. And they also had been thrown out of their homes in 1964 for the last Tokyo Olympics. Oh. So this is a family. So I, I'm speaking to this woman with, with, of course, a translator, this woman in her, her 70s, who's talking to me about being thrown out of her home as a small child. And then again, like being thrown out of her home uh, for these Olympics as well. So people in Tokyo are not happy. There were protests when I was there. But the Olympics, they feel like they're too big to fail. Uh, and they feel like they've got billions of dollars. The Japanese government has invested billions of dollars. And so the show must go on because they have to um, satisfy um, NBC. They have to satisfy the television rights for this. And if they, get the tele if they get the games on television, it doesn't really matter if fans go or not. Right. That's where all the, the, the revenue is generated. Um, what of the idea of, and we should talk about LA, but the story is the same, isn't it? I mean, in, in every place it is, yeah. it is how we get, we're going to, we're going to dispossess people of their homes and we're going to sort of subsume public property and make it private. And it's really just like, this is our urban renewal project but it's for just wealthy people, essentially, going forward. How's that playing yeah, and, out in LA? Have, <laughs> well, just one last thing about how it's playing out in Tokyo is that they've themed it as the recovery games and using Fukushima as a backdrop where they're going to be doing the running of the torch through Fukushima, where there was, of course, natural disasters that led to a nuclear, uh, a brutal nuclear fallout. Um, I, I visited Fukushima. I visited it with scientists who had uh, who ha had those machines whose names I'm forgetting that detect uh, how much nuclear waste is in the area. I mean, it's still a nuclearized zone. And they're going to be doing events in Fukushima, all to spread this idea that recovery games and who knows what the theme is going to be for L.A. But I promise you, we're going to be talking about L.A. for the next eight years, I mean, or seven years, um, not just when the Olympics are about to start in 2028, because there are already huge protests in L.A. There are already um, city council people in L.A. who are who are actually pushing back against the logic of Olympism, which means more police. It means more surveillance. L.A. is already one of the most heavily surveilled cities uh, in the world. Uh, L.A. has a, a absolutely terrible homelessness problem, which is going to be exacerbated by the Olympics. That's what the Echo Park battle was really about. And that's also why a lot of anti-Olympic activists, they were there in Echo Park defending the unhoused people who were there uh, precisely because uh, they see the connection between the Olympic buildup, which has already started, and this attack on people who are at the absolute fringes of Los Angeles. 
Uh, we should just tell people that Echo Park is a, uh, a neighborhood in LA. Uh, there's a park there that had been, um, I guess, uh, you know, uh, basically rehabbed over the past, um, I can't remember how many years ago it was. I, I just did, re, re, you know, I read at one point, like they, they found a car in the pond, a couple of cars in the pond there. Uh, it was cleaned up and it, um, in uh, during the course of, of COVID, it has become basically a small community for unhoused people. Um, and, you know, the different people have different perspectives on, you know, whether that's a good thing or there, but they went in and cleared it um, with a lot of police violence mm -hmm. um, and, you know, with temporary housing for these unhoused people, but it's really just not, it's not doing anything. I mean, it's just basically it's just starting, it's like hitting the reset button again, mm -hmm. but you're destroying a community that had been keeping people safe. Yeah. Um, uh, in, in the process. So, it, and so there's, there's no direct bearing there. It's just, it is similar set of issues. Yeah. Similar set of issues. We, the, the big three are debt displacement and militarization. And in Echo Park, you see the displacement and you see the militarization. And that's what has, has people on edge in LA. And you're, you're going to see so much in the next seven years. You're going to see figures in LA who you've respected in the movies and sports world talk about how great it is that the Olympics are coming. You're going to see uh, protests in the streets by interesting actors like people you might not necessarily think of as a protesting community, uh, like the unhoused people, for example. You're going to see a lot of that um, in the next seven years. And I think we should brace ourselves for it because I think the veil has really been lift, lifted off of what the Olympics are. This isn't the 1984 Olympics anymore with Ronald Reagan coming out in Los Angeles and everybody cheering the fact that the Soviets are boycotting the games and Carl Lewis wins four gold medals. Like those days are done. Uh, well, there's, there's so much more dissent now. Why, can't, can't we just like find a place where they are permanent? I mean, wouldn't that be the solution here? Yeah. Like, you know, I don't know. There's got to, you know, some, uh, I, 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 I don't know some what country. Some the land, build it. So, honestly, yeah. like, you know, uh, and that's the permanent Olympic. Is the reason why we don't do that because people think like, oh, it's not fair? Or is it because this is such a, you know, I don't want to overuse the word, but like neoliberal project here uh, and that, um, that like, there's just too much money. I mean, look, the, the, the TV people would still be able to get their pay, you know, would still be able to make their revenue. Right. It's just that this is used. Is it just that the people who are in charge of the Olympics use this as a way of like enriching certain groups of people, narrow groups of people around the world and everybody gets a, a taste or, I mean, is that why? <clears throat> I mean, it makes so much more sense. And I've been arguing this for years. You find one consistent location to have the games, no matter where they might be, call it Greece, you know, why not? And what's good about that is you don't create what are known as white elephants. Those are stadiums that get used once and then are just left to rot. These stadiums, these facilities could actually have use value with every Olympic games and you could make sure that they're rebuilt and rebuilt well and you create jobs that are actually consistent because you need to keep making sure that upkeep is good. Like that, that makes so much more sense than what they do is creating this kind of travel log as if this is the late 19th century and we're all supposed to be like, ooh, look at Tokyo, land of magic in the Far East. Like, we don't know what Tokyo looks like. But the reason why they do it is exactly the reason that you're saying. Um, and John Carlos, the 1968 Olympian who raised his fist, he once said to me, the reason why they have the Olympics only every four years is that it takes four years to count all the money. And that goes to what you're saying, whether you're talking about commercial sponsorship, whether you're talking about the global anti-terror um, uh, anti-terror weapon industrial complex, which is a real thing, like the, that these companies that go around the world and they sell themselves to mega events like the Olympics to say, we are the best institution for you to bring in for billions of dollars so we can surveil people. And guess what? You can actually keep the equipment, the, the closed circuit TVs and the rest of it after the Olympics are done. So when Olympics leave a place, the places themselves are actually less democratic 
than when they're there in the first place. And the, what's so ironic is that the Olympics, the IOC, they argue, well, the reason why we have to go to places like Beijing is we make Beijing more democratic. We make Beijing more like the West when the opposite is the case. They make the West more authoritarian. Well, uh, Dave Zirin, always a pleasure. Folks, check out Edge of Sports or Dave's writing in the Nation magazine. Can't tell you how much. And looking forward to uh, your book, The Kaepernick Effect, uh, coming out, I think, in the fall, right? Yep, this September. Great. All right, Dave, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Dave. Thank you both.